Thanks for being here. Two weeks ago, I was in Barrie for an interview talking about the one year anniversary of last year's flooding. And hours later, many towns were hit by heavy rain, damaging homes, businesses, and infrastructure. As you might remember, last year's response from the federal government was both unprecedented and swift because they immediately saw the magnitude of flooding through media reporting and then assessed a lot of the damage from helicopters, which helped expedite our federal declaration, bringing resources of FEMA to Vermont quickly. This time around, FEMA is moving in a more traditional path. So while it may seem like it's taking a while for damage to be assessed, it's important to remember it's only been two weeks since the storm. Now, I know for many, two weeks feels like a very, very long time. So we're moving forward with state flood recovery centers. We start opening today and will be a single location for residents to go for help understanding what they need to do to repair damage and move forward. Mr. Morrison will go into more detail in a minute, but it's important to remember these are state recovery centers which we're putting in place while we wait for FEMA to finish their work. FEMA has been in Vermont since last week and is continuing to assess damage. And we now expect to have an update by Saturday to determine if we qualify for an emergency declaration. In the meantime, if you were impacted by flooding, it's important to move flood debris to the right of way as soon as possible as we transition from response to recovery. If you don't have any flood debris yourself, check in on your neighbors and help them get theirs out to the street because next week, we expect debris contractors will begin their work in flood damaged communities. With that, I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Morrison. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. I will be covering several topics today related to the weather, FEMA activities, 211, debris pickup, and flood recovery centers. First, a check in on the weather. There will be widespread showers today, and some areas may see up to an inch of rainfall. We do not anticipate any flooding concerns, but folks should remain watchful and understand that flash flooding is possible any time a storm cell stalls or an area experiences training storms. I've been asked what training storms are. I clearly have spent too much time with my friends at the National Weather Service. Training storms are when a storm cell moves through and immediately another one tr comes along like a train in covers and saturates the same area, sometimes le leading to oversaturation. We anticipate pleasant dry weather for several days starting tomorrow. Next, I would like to discuss flood recovery centers. The state of Vermont will be opening state flood recovery centers in Barrie, Hinesburg, Lindenville, and Plainfield. While the state is still awaiting a determination on whether any counties are eligible for FEMA public assistance or individual assistance, these centers will help those impacted by this month's floods navigate the recovery process. These centers are open to all residents from throughout the state. The first center opened in Plainfield this morning. Flood recovery centers serve as a one-stop shop location where public and private organizations come together to provide state level assistance to those affected by the disaster. Several state and nonprofit agencies involved in individual disaster recovery will be present to answer questions and guide visitors to appropriate services. I want to highlight that there will be mental health services available at these recovery centers. I encourage anyone who is impacted by the flooding to take advantage of this resource. Whether you are an impacted resident, a responder assisting with the aftermath, 
or anyone feeling overwhelmed by recent events, you can stop by and have a snack and a bottle of water provided by the American Red Cross and talk to a trained professional. As the governor mentioned, FEMA representatives have been in Vermont since last week. The first wave of initial damage assessment was completed last Friday. This was an assessment of damage done to public infrastructure to determine if any counties will be eligible to apply for public assistance financial support. We expect to hear about FEMA's determination in the coming days. This week, FEMA had representatives in seven counties evaluating private property losses, such as damage to homes and vehicles, washed out driveways and culverts, and more. This assessment is looking at aggregate damage in communities and will evaluate the eligibility of the state of Vermont to apply for an individual assistance declaration in affected counties. It is important to note that this is just preliminary. They are not trying to see all the damage, but instead they are doing limited inspections to determine if we hit the threshold. If granted, this would open up resources for individual homeowners. An update about 211. As of today, there have been 2,215 reports made to 211 regarding residential damage. There have been 244 reports of damage to businesses. I want to take a minute to emphasize that reporting to 211 is not the same as the damage reporting FEMA will require if a major disaster is declared. At this moment, reporting to 211 is the best way to ensure that FEMA knows you have damage. If we receive an individual assistance declaration, there are separate processes for filing a claim with FEMA. We will provide more information if and when that happens. For now, I just want to ensure that we are spreading the word that a report to 211 is a first step. This initial reporting is the mechanism FEMA will use to determine if additional resources will be made available to us. There will be more steps to take if and when FEMA grants those resources. At the end of the week, there will be some changes in how to request volunteer assistance. On Friday, Crisis Cleanup will close their Vermont hotline. However, volunteer groups will continue to use the system to coordinate work for those who have already requested support. If you still need assistance with muck outs or have not yet asked for flood related assistance and volunteer support, you can call 211 and they will forward your request to serve Vermont. Lastly, I want to talk a little trash. The most important message I can offer is what the governor said to move flood-related debris out of your home and to the public right-of-way. Follow any guidance your local community has offered. Vermont Emergency Management is working closely with municipalities to assist them in reimbursement for debris pickup and with technical assistance for pickup in certain communities. VEM has also enacted debris management contracts as part of the state emergency management plan. This will bring specialized contractors to Vermont to assist in areas where the volume of debris removal is highest. This will be coordinated through local municipalities and in concert with resources from the Agency of Transportation. Resources will likely be arriving next week. In the meantime, clean up, dry out, and get that debris to the right of way. Thank you.
My team and I will be available for questions later, but for now, I will turn things over to Secretary Flynn from the Agency of Transportation. Thank you, Commissioner Morrison. Good morning. I will start with letting you know that last week, Governor Scott issued an executive department proclamation that due to heavy rain, flooding, erosion, mudslides, and other damage from Hurricane Barrel, Vermont sustained severe damage to its road system, including bridges, roadbeds, and other facilities on both the federal aid as well as non-federal aid highways. This proclamation stated an emergency existed throughout the state, therefore qualifying for aid under the Federal Highway Administration's Emergency Relief Program. With this action, AOT has requested quick release funds to assist with the cost of the repairs to the state roads and bridges. To the roads, bridges, and rails report today. Three roads remain closed this morning, and that is due to three bridges remaining closed as well. Those roads and bridges are Route 5 in Barnet, Route 100 in Duxbury, with the possibility of that one being opened toward the end of the weekend, and Route 2 in East St. Johnsbury. I'd remind you this is down from 54 roads when we first reported and eight bridges. Active rail today, there are two closures that remain. We have opened the NECR line. I should say NECR has opened its line. The Amtrak Vermonter is now running on its regular schedule and freight rail is moving again on this line. Work does continue on the Connecticut River line along the eastern side of the state and it does remain closed at this time. Work also continues on the Washington County Railroad from Montpelier Junction through Montpelier into Barrie and up to Websterville. Rail trails, the LVRT remains with two closures. From milepost 13 Point seven to fourteen point two in Danville Village to West Danville Park and Ride. There is a detour in place on Whiteman Road at mile post thirteen point seven. The second closure is mile post thirteen point three to mile post forty point six. This is the Hardwick Trailhead to Wolcott Village. That is from last summer. All public transit is operating as scheduled and there are no issues with state-run airports. That concludes my remarks. I too will be here for questions. And now I would turn it over to a &R Secretary Moore. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to start by taking a moment to thanking the dedicated volunteers, state employees, municipal officials, including public work staff and road crews, support organizations and individual Vermonters that continue to assess damage, dig out, and plan for repairs. As the governor has indicated, recovery from a flood is a very long process. Knowing that those involved in flood response can feel overwhelmed or all consumed, I do hope you're all able to find moments to enjoy the beauty of summer in Vermont. And when you get out there to enjoy a hike in the woods, I urge you to prioritize safety and environmental conservation by respecting trail closures. These closures are crucial to ensuring the safety of hikers, bikers, and wildlife alike as our trails recover from the impact of this month's hard rains. Trails closed due to flooding or storm damage may seem tempting to explore, but doing so can jeopardize personal safety and hinder recovery efforts. 
Walking or biking on closed trails can exacerbate erosion, damage delicate habitats, and impede the restoration work being undertaken by state parks and recreation staff and other trail stewards. We understand the desire to enjoy Vermont's natural beauty, especially during challenging times. But your cooperation in honoring these trail closures is vital. By respecting them, you contribute directly to the preservation of our outdoor spaces, ensuring they remain safe and accessible for everyone in the future. There are really innumerable opportunities for outdoor recreation in Vermont. And so once again, I am encouraging you to use Trail Finder and information available on ANR's flood page under the recreation heading to ensure that your destination is ready to receive you. Trails in northern Vermont were the most severely affected. Assessments are ongoing and many areas are difficult to access due to road damage. The damage to infrastructure on state lands, and this includes both roads and trails in northern Vermont, we believe is actually greater than during last year's storms. Despite the extent of the damage, it feels less visible due to the remoteness of the affected areas. As I've shared in a prior press conference, the damage to state parks was mostly localized to the Groton and Waterbury areas. While there was significant road, beach, and campsite damage at multiple parks, as well as some rental units, we are making swift progress on our repairs. And at this point, of our 55 staff state parks, only Sayon Lodge remains closed. Damage to trails, parks, and other recreational infrastructure, including outdoor businesses and forest economy businesses, we know impacts the recovery of communities who rely on these resources for the health and wellness of their residents, but also as an attraction for visitors, sources of employment, and actual drivers of local economy. Private landowners should also report damage to trails and forest economy business infrastructure, such as logging roads, by calling 211. Shifting gears, I wanted to provide brief updates on the agency's flood response work. To date, the geology team has received nearly two dozen reports of erosive events and landslide activity and continues to make site visits to assess impacted properties. The spills response team has received more than 35 reports of flood-related spills and has contractors working on affected properties, most of which have been cleaned up at this point. The dam safety program has visited 44 dams since last week's storm and damage continues to be minimal. Our river engineers have received upwards of 100 requests for technical assistance in evaluating changes in stream channels and addressing significant accumulations of flood-related debris. At this point, we have issued 21 emergency protective and next flood measure authorizations. Only two boil water notices remain in place in this time, both in Barnet, all other public drinking water systems, are back online. And on the wastewater side, the Plainfield Wastewater Facility is still facing some repairs. They are being supported by experts from the Vermont Rural Water Association in completing the needed work, and all other wastewater facilities are online. As we continue in our flood recovery efforts, we encourage Vermonters to contact us for assistance a full list of resources is on the agency's flood webpage, anr.vermont.gov slash flood. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the governor for questions. Thank you, Secretary Moore. We'll now open up to questions. Governor, these uh, flood recovery centers that the state is standing up, what is your sense that they'll actually help people access funding? Uh, recovery funds. Well, again, we hope to know fairly soon uh, whether we can even apply uh, for a declaration. Uh, we should know that by the end of the week, and um, at least for public assistance, and then individual assist assistance will follow. Um, but this does give a platform for people to 
come in, get advice, what they should be doing, um, taking lots of pictures and so forth, what, what's available to them right now. Uh, but until we hear uh, specifically about the individual assistance, um, the funding will be in question. How long do you intend for these to stay open? Um, sure. Yeah. So a note, a note to what you just asked. Three weeks is the answer to the state-run recovery centers. And some of the assistance that someone might find there is exactly what the governor said. The people prepping them that in the event we receive FEMA assistance, they already have their documentation ready to plug and play. So the next iteration of this would be what FEMA calls MARCs. Disaster recovery. Oh, disaster recovery centers, sorry. Um, so if we do get a declaration for IA, they will set up disaster recovery centers, which are the federal version of what we're doing at the state level. And that is where you can go and actually have assistance filling out and making your uh, submission of photos and declaration of damages to FEMA. So this is a bit of the forerunner to, if, to what will happen if we get the assistance from FEMA, uh, which we're, you know, we're really hopeful for. Um, so three weeks, and we have four communities that they will be active in, and that is uh, Barry, Hinesburg, Lindenville, and Plainfield. And of course, anyone who is impacted can go to one of those. It's not specific to residents or damage that occurred in that town. And who is uh, the staff these, and how much are they costing the state? I, I don't know the answer to cost it off the top of my head, dear. Um, we have uh, folks from the Red Cross. We have folks from the Agency of Human Services. We have mental health professionals, basic medical services, fire safety, fire safety inspectors. Uh, and there's also supplies there, like cleaning supplies and snacks and water for, for people. Uh, so there's a variety of resources, and it might not be exactly the same at every center, but um, it's also really meant to connect people. If somebody comes in with a need and it's not able to be resourced in that center, we have staff there that can help direct someone, whether that's to a nonprofit that might be able to assist them or to a state-run program that perhaps they're not enrolled in. So it, it's really meant to be a touch point for people to come and say, I have this need and for us to try and be navigators for them. You're welcome. Um, just to add just a little bit more on that, um, it's also beneficial to us uh, so that we understand what the need is out there. Uh, because as much as we go out into the field, we don't talk to every single person, every single community member who may be affected. I think um, there, we're going to find that there's a lot of hidden damage out there that we haven't seen yet on some of these back roads uh, in, in these communities. And the damage uh, might, uh, might have affected their homes. So again, uh, this is beneficial to us as well. What happens if FEMA or the White House does approve a disaster declaration? What happens to these state centers? Say if FEMA comes in to set up their own, would the state ones close and then to FEMA yeah, we, we would at that point assist FEMA in any way we possibly can, okay. and they would set up their sites. Okay. Vermont Public had a really robust story recently on FEMA response last year, and included in that story there were some concerns over the um, efficacy of the disaster recovery centers. Some days there were more staffers there than people who came in um, to request assistance. How will you make sure that the state centers are run more efficiently? Well, again, um, when you have more of the recovery people in these centers than you have people coming in, uh, I suppose that may be good news, um, rather than the other way around. Uh, if we had more need than we had people to assist, uh, we'd be complaining about just the opposite. So I'd rather have this happen. Uh, and. From our standpoint, again, we don't know what to expect at this point. So uh, we will adjust uh, as needed. Uh, I would think that we would be a little bit more nimble uh, than the federal government, but we'll we'll see. Anything you want to add on that? So 
Secretary Moore mentioned 21 emergency protective authorizations for like river corridors. What 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 are some of those projects? What do they look like? What, where are they? Yeah, I would I would expect that it's probably protecting stream banks and maybe taking debris out, dredging in some some cases. Sure. Um, one example would be uh, South Peach and Brook jumped its banks and formed an entirely new channel during the flood event um, and cut off access to at least one residence. So the uh, river engineers have been on site working with the town road crew to return the brook to its prior channel. Um, and that kind of work requires an emergency authorization from the state. I would say. I don't know for sure, but I was in Starksboro the other day and saw where the stream was now coming through the field, uh, impacting the road and completely by maybe 500 feet missing the river, uh, the, uh, the uh, original uh, river banks because it had been filled in. So that was another situation where I think it was like two or 3,000 feet up into the up into the woods uh, that needed to be cleaned out in some way to get it back into its original form. All right, we'll, well, the well, thank you very much. Lola <laughs> <laughs> from Mount Public. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if. Uh, are there any estimates yet of how many rental units have been impacted by the flooding? I'm not sure that there is, but I'll I'll let others answer that. But of course, we have the one that's that is very visible is the one in Plainfield uh, with the uh, nine units, I believe, in that uh, that home. So I expect there are many others, uh, probably in the Barry area, and. Um, maybe in the Lindenville area as well. Yeah, we understand that that's a number that a lot of uh, individuals are looking to kind of cement, but the, the, the issue is that we're anecdotally collecting that information through 211, through DFS um, uh, surveys, through American Red Cross uh, surveys, but in the end, really what's gonna happen is those individuals in those residential properties will need to fill out a FEMA application, and that puts one application on one property, and then FEMA will literally go to that property and ascertain what is the actual damage level. Uh, so that's a few steps ahead, um, but like the governor said, we, we've seen a lot of damage, and uh, we understand that a lot of individuals are having uh, some housing needs, as, and we're working on those as well. Thanks. Is there also, um been a big jump or you know have we collected numbers on if um, applications for buyouts have increased or interest in buyouts has increased since you know this this most recent flood i don't yeah. know that's an error question so again anecdotally it's uh, for reference in the 10 years prior to last year's flood we had about uh around 150 buyouts and for last year's flood, we had about 200 uh, that are potentially in the pipeline. Uh, so we are already seeing significant amount of applications for this current flood as well. So uh, the program is working very well. Uh, we are working with FEMA to make sure that that moves forward. Uh, and we have some other uh, systems that the legislator set up for us to assist individual uh, locations that aren't able to exactly meet FEMA requirements. So there's a couple different options. So uh, the recovery uh, and mitigation teams at VEM are really working diligently on that and going out to towns and ensuring that they understand uh, what's going on. Uh, there are, uh, the caveat is the town and the residents both have to agree on the buyout. Uh, so uh, working with the municipality and uh, the, the, the homeowner to, to get that done. Thank you. Um, and then sorry, just one more quick question then I'll let it go. Um, do we have an update uh, on the number of homes that have been self-reported to be uninhabitable? Um, interesting you should ask that. I, in the SEOC brief this morning, I'd ask the same thing. Right. So I think we're trying to get that information together. We have, uh, we have the numbers, but we need to just put them all together. <laughs> so as Director Foran mentioned, it's a difficult number to nail down because self-reports of uninhabitable or of severe damage 
is an undefined term. It's whatever somebody tells 211 the condition of their house is. So there's no definition of a category. And in some of those circumstances, people are still living in their home, even though they've described it as uninhabitable or severely damaged. So we have anecdotal evidence that there may be between 100 and 150 homes that are self-reported as uninhabitable or seriously damaged. But we can't say that with any authority until a, a process by which an, an assessment happens on every single property. And that would only happen if FEMA comes through with an IA de uh, declaration. So we can only we can only relay to you what folks relay to 211 and what we hear from our fire inspectors that go out. Uh, but it, I can't tell you that that is a perfect number. Thank you. That's all for me. You're welcome. Again, just to add to that, um, the term I heard this morning was uh, there might be a, a home that's not accessible. Um, so that doesn't mean it can't be lived in, but their driveway may be washed out. So that's another category uh, that we're trying to put together with everything else. All right, back to the room. Governor, the Conservation Law Foundation is being put the state on notice uh, about a potential lawsuit coming, essentially a disagreement over how we're measuring our carbon reduction targets uh, or, or uh, requirements, that is. Have you seen, heard of this? What, what are your thoughts? Um, I heard that I was faced, or we were faced uh, with another lawsuit. Seems to be a pattern growing here, but uh, I think we're doing what we're supposed to do under the law, uh, but if they sue us in 60 days, we'll take it to court. What's your assessment of where we stand with the Global Warming Solutions Act, right? We've got these, these requirements that are set in law, you vetoed it originally. You know, the Climate Council has been working, the subcommittees have been doing their thing. What, what's your assessment just of like how the work's been going? Well, it's difficult work. Um, as you may recall, one of the reasons I vetoed it was because I was concerned about somebody suing the state. And here we go. So it's, it's based on a lot of factors. I mean, we have to have uh, money uh, to follow through on some of the recommendations. I think we are following the law. Um, I might let Secretary Moore answer more of that um, on that question. But, um, but I, I think we're following the law. That's, the law is in place. I may disagree with it. Uh, but the law is in place, and we have an obligation to follow through. And I think we're doing that. I would just add that the concerns raised by CLF in their petition appear to be repetitive that, to concerns that were raised um, back in January. At that point in time, we fully reviewed the concerns, the different data sets that were being recommended, um, and feel confident with the approach we have proceeded with. If the state doesn't meet its requirements, let's just say that a judge says, we're, we're not meeting our requirements. Uh, we'll, we'll have to, of course, meet the, you know, implement policies to, to reduce carbon. I mean, what would that look like? There, there are a lot of really significant and consequential policies that are in the process of being stood up at this point, including the clean heat standard, um, where a major report from the P Department of Public Service will be released um, in the middle of September as well as our commitment to uh, the clean car and clean truck standards that will see the phase out of the sale of new internal combustion engine vehicles by 2035. Um, and so I, I think it's a totality of that information that needs to be considered. Um, there is obviously at some point a limit to what Vermonters can, can take on at once. And um, I think we've got a, a couple of big uh, really consequential policy changes that are already in process um, and hope there would be consideration given to the impact those will have on the ground in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions. So if that, it would just speed like if we were found, just so I'm clear, like if we were, uh, if the judge said you're not meeting the GWSA, it would maybe speed up those requirements or speed up the clean heat standard or that kind of thing. 
I'm not clear that they can be accelerated. Uh, one of the questions the Public Service Department will answer in their report is whether or not uh, the 2030 requirements put in place by the legislature regarding how we transition, how we heat our homes and businesses are achievable just based on supply, supply chain issues, the availability of contractors to perform the work. That's why I think that's a really important piece of information and, and frankly one we encourage the legislature to benefit from before uh, plowing ahead with, with enacting the clean heat standard. Last question. Do you know how much like a lawsuit, like like this specific, how much this costs the state? It, I, it's hard to say. There's both a, an actual cost and an opportunity cost, right? I, I have to redirect staff resources um, to pull records related to the concerns CLF has expressed to review their alternate modeling approach as we haven't had that opportunity yet to, to dig into the details of, of what they have um, used to make their own determination and certainly the, the legal resources required to represent the agency in court from both my staff as well as the Attorney General's office. Speaking of the clean heat standard, um, for either of you or both of you, the um, Speaker Kowinski put out a statement today alleging misinformation by stakeholders, including Americans for Prosperity, on the impact that the Affordable Heat Act will have on Vermonters. I'm wondering what you make of that claim and concern from the speaker. Again, I haven't seen either statement, so okay. hard for me to comment on that. Okay. I haven't have seen you, it either. Have you seen any sort of campaign material or mailers or whatnot from Americans for Prosperity that she might be talking about? I have not seen them, nor have I received them. Okay. Do you think it's misinformation for a group, an interest group, to be raising concerns over? I, I think they're claim is that, you know, the heating prices are going to spike up for... for well, I think that's true. Okay. So you don't think that's misinformation? I don't know what they said exactly, okay. but I'm just saying I think heating costs will rise okay. as a result of this action. Okay. I think I said that. I think if you read my uh, veto letter, I think it spells that out. Okay. I think it's strange that a legislative leader would raise concerns about undue influence being exerted upon the state of Vermont by an out-of-state organization? Um, I don't know how to answer that even. I, I, I think it's within her right uh, to, to push back if she doesn't believe it to be true. But I also believe that you know, it's free speech. If someone wants to make that argument, they, sh they should be able to. Uh, so last Saturday, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Hale of Lunenburg crashed his car into the uh, AOT building in St. Jay and at the same time trashed the, uh, some of the state police building there. And his lawyer says he was really upset about being a repeated victim of crime. And I'm wondering if, if you know anything about the details of that and whether there's any concern that crime victims may be uh, blaming the state to some degree for this. I, I have not uh, heard that, and uh, as you described, I would think that uh, he sounds like a repeat offender of some sort, uh, taking the action that he took in that Actually, manner. Actually, his last crime was in 2019, and it was for DUI. Well, he might have been. I, <laughs> I mean, crashing your vehicle yeah. into a building uh, in protest of something, of committing you know, some sort of crime or some sort of pattern, I think kind of makes the case, but. Anything you want to add to that? Not really. I, I've not heard that version of um, reason why someone should be excused for their unlawful behavior, including assaulting members of the road work crew. Okay. Um, I think that, that what you just described to me is emblematic of our societal inability to be accountable for our own actions and that has been a common theme of the last decade it's always somebody else's fault there's always a reason why i stepped out of bounds and the lack of people being able to be self-aware and accountable for their own actions uh, has declined in, in my time in this job so okay. I, I all i can say is that's no excuse for destroying 
tax own, taxpayers' property and assaulting members of uh, a work crew who are trying to fix our infrastructure so people can get around. Any thoughts on the uh, vice president making a uh, run for the nation's top job? Well, we've certainly seen uh, history in the making uh, over the last week. And uh, interesting times, as I said in the last press conference. So we'll have to see how this plays out. Um, the Democratic Party will have to uh, nominate uh, this, uh, this the VP. Uh, it sounds as though that's going to happen. There's momentum there. Um, but, um, but then, you know, as the dust settles, uh, she's going to have to, to prove herself. She's going to have to tell us who she is. Um, this has been uh, different in some respects. The vice president in this administration hasn't been as visible as others that I've seen in recent history, uh, whether it was uh, Vice President Pence um, or Vice President Biden. Uh, they took a more visible role. And um, so I look forward to, to hearing more about her and what her agenda is and, and why she, um, she's the right choice. Have you met her, and, and what, what do you think that, how, how should be for the job financially? I, I really don't know her. Uh, I have met her. I've met her husband when he came uh, to Vermont, uh, but, uh, but I, don't, I don't know her. Uh, all I know is that um, she was a U.S. Senator from California, and she was a Attorney General in California, and that's about it. You've made it really clear that you're not going to support Trump I am in not. this re-election bid. What do you make? Of, is Harris someone you can see yourself voting for? Again, I think she has to prove herself and tell us, tell, tell Americans how she's going to deal with inflation, uh, the affordability uh, of the nation, the border, uh, how she's going to unite the country. I mean, these are all things that, that we'll look forward to hearing. Does that make you an elusive swing voter? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, as I've seen this play out over the last few days, obviously this is a uh, fast forward uh, of the primary system. Uh, she's got to convince the Democrats first that she's the right choice. Uh, so she's got to do that in a short period of time. And, uh, and at that point, we'll see she has to, Democrats aren't going to be able to elect her. Uh, it's going to be, I think, independents, uh, those those in the middle, that are going to make the decision as to who becomes the next president. So we'll see what she does and how she reacts. Take your job out of the equation as a voter. What are you looking for as she's somebody that can unite the country, deal with inflation, secure our borders. I mean, there's those basic issues. How is she going to? I don't know what her position is on Ukraine. I don't know what her position is in any uh, military activity. I, I just don't know. So those are the types of things I think Americans want to know. Do you think that uh, Biden setting aside was the right call? I do. I said that in the last press conference uh, that, that I thought he should, he should step down for the good of the country, and he did, uh, to his credit. He did what was best for the country. Um, speaking of Washington, uh, Israel Prime Minister Netanyahu is going to be making his address to Congress. Um, my understanding is that all three of our congressional delegates um, don't plan on attending. What do you make of that? Will you be tuning in? I, I probably won't tune into it, but I will. I will probably view the results and. Uh, listen to as much of it as I can. I think it's important. I mean, this conflict has gone on too long. We, we hope to see some resolution. And uh, I think it's important to hear from the leader of, of Israel at this point. Um, back to flood stuff really quick. Um, it, is it still the case that we're seeking a FEMA declaration for individual assistance in just two counties, or is that has no, that list grown since I, last week? I seven believe it's, yeah, I believe it was like seven counties. That for were individual. individual. Right. Oh, okay. I believe. 
Eight for public, seven for individual. Okay. But there's always the ability to add on. <clears throat> okay, okay, good. good thing I asked. Where do we stand with damage to farms? I know there was a survey that went out. What are you hearing from farmers? Yeah, there's, there's a substantial amount of damage. I, I'm not sure that it's as significant as uh, a year ago, but it's, it's significant enough. So, and businesses as well. We're trying to determine how much damage there is there and, uh, and contemplating whether we're going to have to provide, well, we'd like to provide some assistance, but I'm going to have to deal with the emergency board to, to do that. That was actually the other question is, is, do you see the state standing up or reviving VGAP or a program specifically for farmers too? Well, I mean, we did ask for the USDA uh, to get involved and declare uh, some sort of a, a emergency situation. Um, so farms are businesses too. Uh, we'll try and do whatever we can uh, to help everyone involved. We can't make everyone whole, um, but as we found with BGAP, it was essential for getting people back on their feet and businesses back, you know, open and employees coming back to work. All of that has to work. We're going to pay for everything that we're we want to pay for. I mean, we, that we've we've set out to do. So it's important. Governor. Yes. SBA is embedded with the teams with FEMA and AHS. Uh, the Small Business Administration has people joining FEMA out in the field on these assessments. So there's a member from the state, a, a, a state employee, FEMA reps, and an SBA rep doing the assessments as they go through the communities. They're, they're broken into three teams, and they're here all week, and they have morning assignments and afternoon assignments for towns to visit. Again, this is important to remember that this is not <coughs> every single resident or business gets visited. They're trying to make see if we trigger these thresholds, right? So it's the preliminary damage assessment, but the S Small Business Administration is here and with FEMA in the field. To further remind everyone, SBA um, gives loans out. They, they don't make grants. Right? They don't make grants. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. okay. Uh, have you, I know that the delegation has requested uh, an agricultural disaster declaration from USDA. Have you heard from the department at this point on that? I have not. Okay. So you mentioned the e board as well. I, I know you said you used met with uh, Tom Kibet and Jeff Carr last week, maybe surplus-ish, whoa, uh, what, what, what did you hear? With Jeff Carr. Oh, Jeff, Jeff. okay. Yeah. What, what did you hear? Um, generally, good news, um, and then we'll be able to talk about that next week, but uh, yeah, we ended the year in good shape. I always worry about the year uh, coming up, but uh, especially with all the damage, but we'll see what happens. And anything more that you can share just on like what the impact, you know, how, how state revenues will, will or won't be able to cover some of the damage we're seeing? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, they won't be able to cover. There's not an appropriation to be made for that uh, unless we change and, and, uh, and change the uh, current path for, for money that is spent. So we can't, uh, we can't just spend new money. And there was a, a formula for that. So we'll be, you know, assessing all of that and what, uh, what we'll be asking of the, uh, of the legislature, of the e-board. But I would expect uh, we need, we know what our the challenges are uh, with businesses in particular. Um, some of the uh, mobile homes as well, uh, but, uh, but housing, you know, it gets down to housing as well. We, we have been challenged by housing for a number of years. Uh, as we know, um, the last flood exacerbated that, and this flood did as well. So we need to do something now. So you'll be making some sort of ask we're, we're, cont we're contemplating that. Of, of housing direct stimulus? All the above. Do you foresee a need to call an emergency legislative session to get that work done? I, I don't believe we'd need to uh, at this point. I think we can work with the e-board and redirect maybe some of the existing funding okay. to get us through this until we get to January. Okay. And then use the BAA to fill in the blanks? Possibly. Okay. So I missed last week's press conference. Uh, I know a lot of my 
readers are asking, hoping the administration takes a second look at dredging or some sort of river, river modification. Yeah. Uh, what is the latest on that? Yeah, I mean, I mean what the, I guess the missing information for many, and, and I get it. Uh, it looks so obvious uh, to dredge the rivers, dig them down, get the water flowing through, and all our problems are solved. And it's, it's just not that easy. As we know, when you, first of all, there's 7,000 miles of streams and brooks in Vermont. Uh, to think that we're going to even dredge half of that uh, is just, just not, not obtainable. Um, and when you think about, as a contractor myself for 35 years doing that work, how difficult it is working in water and, uh, and in streams and and it's very expensive and, and very difficult to do. You have to prioritize. I think there are areas uh, that should be dredged, and, um, and I'll let Secretary Moore talk about this a little bit more uh, to, to maybe um, talk, maybe to answer your question uh, as she did last week. I think there were 400 uh, permits that were given for dredging uh, last year. And, uh, and we expect that we'll have to do more this year. But I agree. I think, what we, I think what we should all agree on is we need more reservoir. We need more storage capacity. They might think it, it needs to go down. Uh, I would uh, argue that once you go down, it fills with water. If you don't have a perfect slope, uh, then you have not cre increased the capacity because you filled it with water. If you can go wider, um, and, and do it in a tiered fashion, uh, then you'd have something. Then you could store water. And so I, we agree, we need more storage capacity. I think that's what they're saying as well, maybe in a different way. But if we can agree that we need to take property in different areas and uh, reconfigure the property so that we have more storage capacity, that's the answer. Maybe I can just add a little bit to that. Uh, the governor's correct. We did issue uh, 400 next flood emergency protective measures uh, last following last summer's floods, and those are um, permits to allow folks to to go into the river in strategic areas, remove um, often woody debris and gravel, um, particularly where that those uh, materials are posing an imminent risk to a culvert or bridge, so trying to keep that, that um, capacity under those existing pieces of infrastructure. Um, I think it's important to, to sort of maintain the perspective on the limits on how deep you can dredge. The governor spoke to some of the, the extent of rivers and streams in Vermont um, and cost, but it's also just a matter of practicality. Uh, one of our river engineers shared with me that their best assessment is um, prior to the advent of the city of Barrie, uh, the floodplain around the Stevens Branch in Barrie was somewhere between 500 and 1,000 feet wide. In general now, the Stevens Branch as it moves through Barrie is about 50 feet wide. And so in order to, regain, to reduce flood levels by a foot, if that's what would have spread out over that floodplain historically, you'd need to dig down 100 feet. And we all know uh, we're going to hit bedrock well before we dig 100 feet in any river channel in Vermont. And so it is looking for those opportunities to create floodplain storage. I had the opportunity to talk with the executive director of the Friends of the Winooski last night, and they did an assessment in Northfield um, where they have a, a large floodplain restoration project following a series of FEMA buyouts. Uh, Northfield didn't see the kind of precipitation other parts of central Vermont did um, on July 10th. Uh, but it was a 50-year storm, so a pretty significant rainfall event. And their estimates are in that storm alone, it reduced flood levels by six inches, which can often be the difference between people having water in their basement and water reaching their, their first floor. So a really significant improvement on a fairly small five-acre site. And we need to look for, for more of those opportunities in strategic locations throughout Vermont. What's the very solution? So uh, we're, we are working on that. I, I think it's a combination of measures. Certainly, once you're in the city, the channel's pretty constrained by homes and businesses that will be hard. Uh, the governor had shared a, a vision, a plan last fall uh, for, for some potent, uh, potential buyouts and opportunities that may create. 
also looking upstream and places we, we can further slow and spread out water so it doesn't come with that same force and intensity into the city. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you all.